The year was 1811, and a carriage pulled up in front of a large brick manor house. And the sole occupant of that carriage was a young boy by the name of Stephen Elliott. And Stephen, Stephen hopped out of that carriage. He ran up the stairs and knocked on the door of that manor house. And as he waited for someone to answer, he looked around. The manor house was huge. It had three stories and two great wings. And the grounds were extensive. And everything was trimmed and clipped. Now, the manor house belonged to his aged cousin, a man by the name of Abner Dabney. And Stephen had never met Mr. Dabney. But the reason why he was meeting him on this day was because six months before, young Stephen had become an orphan and Mr. Dabney had offered to adopt Stephen. Now, no one knew much about Mr. Dabney. I, they knew he was a scholar. They knew he wrote extensively about pagan practices. He seemed one of the world's authorities on ancient rituals, but he was a recluse. He kept to his writings, his books. Well, at last, the door opened, and there was the butler, Parks. Parks invited Stephen into the foyer, and as Stephen was standing there, an inner door opened, and out came a tall, thin man, Mr. Dabney, who came over to Stephen and said, Oh, Master Stephen, Master Stephen, oh, how, how, how old are you? How was your journey? Stephen said, my trip was fine, sir. He said, oh, good, good, good. I, I, how old are you? When is your birthday? It seems strange that this distant cousin had asked Stephen how old he was twice within a minute of meeting him. But Stephen answered, I'm 11, sir. Uh, my birthday is next March. Oh, good, 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 good. Um, Parks, uh, take Master Stephen to the kitchen and get him dinner or supper or whatever is appropriate. And then he turned around and he went back into the study. Well, Parks took Stephen to the kitchen and there he met Mrs. Bunch. Now, Mrs. Bunch had been the housekeeper for decades and she was a very friendly talkative woman so the two of them started talking and within 15 minutes they were the best of friends well in the months to come stephen would have many questions for mrs bunch and some of them she could answer and some of them she could not there was one night when the two of them were sitting before the fire and Stephen suddenly turned to Mrs. Bunch and said, is my cousin a good man? Will he go to heaven? Mrs. Bunch said, oh, my dear Stephen, I've never met such a generous soul. He took you in, didn't he? And you know you are not the first child he tried to help. He helped two others, a boy and a girl. So Stephen asked, where are they now? Mrs. Bunch said, I don't know. Curious it is. You see, one day Master went to the market and there was this little girl wandering around. She was a gypsy. She had no family. So he brought her home and made her comfortable. But you know, three weeks later, we woke up one morning and she was gone. Oh, the master was beside himself. He, he had the pond dragged. He, he had the forest searched, but we couldn't find a trace of her. We think she ran off with some gypsies who were camping in the forest nearby. Parks heard them singing the night before. So Stephen asked, well, what about the boy? And she said, oh, master found him at the market too, Giovanni, an Italian a foreigner. He was playing a little tin flute begging for pennies, but he had no family. So the master brought him home, thought he'd show him a good life, 
but you know, the little ingrate ran off after a month. You know, he ran away so quickly, he did not even bring his tin flute. It's, that's it right up there on the shelf. And she pointed to a dusty tin flute up on the shelf. Stephen took it down, wiped it off, and he spent the rest of the evening tootling on that flute. Well, that night, Stephen had an unusual dream. Now, Stephen's bedroom was up on the third floor of the house, and down the hall, there was a bathroom that was not used. The door was locked, and there was a glass panel in that bathroom door that was normally covered by a curtain. Well, in his dream, Stephen was standing outside that bathroom door and he was peering through the window and he could see the moonlight coming in and illuminating a lead-lined bathtub. And in that tub, there was a figure that looked like a child that was wrapped in a shroud and its thin arms were crossed on its chest, its hands above its heart and its lips were pressed in a thin line. Well, in his dream, as Stephen looked through that window, he saw those thin lips part, and then this moan came out, this moan that just grew and grew, and was so frightening that in his dream, Stephen jumped back from the bathroom door. And in jumping back, Stephen woke himself up and he discovered that he was standing in the hallway outside that bathroom door. And with a courage you rarely find in children, he stepped forward and he looked through that bathroom door. He saw the moonlight shining in, illuminating that tub, and the tub was empty. Well, the next morning, he told Mrs. Bunch about his dream, and she listened, oh my. And then she promptly replaced the curtain on that bathroom door. And Stephen also told his elder cousin about his dream, and Mr. Dabney listened very carefully, asked many questions, and took copious notes in one of his ever-present notebooks. Well, after that, two strange things happened. The first was after Stephen had had a fitful night of sleep. Well, the next day he found Mrs. Bunch sewing on his nightshirt. And she said, oh, Master Stephen, I, I would be most appreciative if you would not tear your nightshirt in this manner. And she held up his nightshirt and over the left part of his chest, there were parallel slits, parallel cuts in the fabric. Stephen said, I didn't do that. Those look like the marks outside my bedroom door, and I, I didn't do those either. Mrs. Bunch looked at him, and then she put down her sewing. She went upstairs, came down a few minutes later, and said, Stephen, do you lock your bedroom door at night? He said, I do. And then I say my prayers. She said, good boy. The second thing that happened was that one night when they were in the games room, Stephen was sitting on the floor. He was playing with some blocks when all of a sudden the door flew open and there was Parks. And Parks said to Mrs. Bunch, oh, Master can get his own wine from the cellar in the evening if he wants it. I heard them again, the talking rats or beasts or whatever they are. She, she said, oh, Parks, talking rats. He said, I've heard sailors talk about talking rats, but I put my ear to the wall. I hear them talking plain as day. She said, oh, Parks, you don't want to scare the boy. Parks turned. For the first time he saw Stephen, he tried to laugh. <laughs> the boy knows I'm kidding. And Stephen laughed, but he knew that Parks was not kidding. 
was soon it was getting on towards March. And one crisp spring day, Stephen stood outside. The weak sun was shining and the air was crisp and the wind was blowing through the bare branches of the trees and the whole world felt restless. Stephen felt as though there was this endless procession of spirits passing by. Well, that day at lunch, the elder cousin said to Stephen, uh, Stephen, could you please come by my study tonight at 11 o'clock? I have a little surprise for you. Go to bed at your normal time and please do not tell Mrs. Parks or M Mrs. Bunch what I have asked you to do. Could you do that for me? It will be our secret. Well, Stephen was excited, the whole idea of having a secret with his elder cousin. Later that afternoon, Stephen was passing through the foyer, and he saw that the study door was open, and through the crack of the door, he could see that his cousin was near the fireplace, bending over a pan that seemed to hold charcoal. Nearby, there was a decanter of red wine, and what looked to be an ancient silver chalice. Well, that night, Stephen went to bed at the normal time, but he was so excited he couldn't sleep. And as it was cl getting close to 11 o'clock, he went to the window. A full moon had risen. And as Stephen looked out the window, he suddenly saw two figures standing down on the grounds it appeared to be children, a boy and a girl, and they were staring up at Stephen. And there was something about the girl that reminded him of the figure that had been in the bathtub. She wore a ragged dress. Her thin arms were crossed over her chest, her hands over her heart, and her thin lips were in a crooked smile. And the boy, was dressed in rags, and he held his hands twisted like claws up towards Stephen. His nails were long, they glinted in the moonlight, and as he grinned at Stephen, he clawed the air. But what was particularly hideous was that on the boy's chest, where his heart should have been, there was a black hole. Well, the boy clawed the air and then he reached down and took the girl's hand and the two of them ran toward the house and were lost from Stephen's view. This frightened Stephen very much. And as it was close to 11 o'clock, shaking, he made his way down to the study. And when he got to the study door, he heard his elder cousin talking on the other side of the door. So Stephen tried the doorknob, but the door wouldn't open. And then he heard his cousin begin to shout. And then there was a scream and Stephen pushed against the door, but it seemed to be locked, but the key was there, but the door would not open. The scream went on and suddenly there was this gurgling sound, this that just went on and on and on and on as Stephen pushed against the door and then there was silence. Stephen pushed the door one last time. The door flew open and there was his cousin. He was in the chair, his head thrown back, his face contorted in rage and pain, but his body was motionless. His chest, something had, had torn off his clothes, had, had torn back his flesh, had pulled up the muscle, the bone exposed his heart. And Stephen watched as that heart bump, bump, pumped once, pump, pump, pumped twice, and then stopped. Nothing else in the room was disturbed, not even the long, sharp knife on the desk next to his cousin. The window was open. Stephen 
would inherit his cousin's estate. And some adults would come and pack up all the books in his cousin's study. So it would be some years before Stephen found the boxes and the books and the journal and its last entry, which was this. The ancients have a practice that some today would consider to be barbaric. But through this practice, they can achieve eternal life. I have long been intrigued by the whole concept of ascendancy, that idea by taking on qualities of others, one can achieve certain spiritual insights. I have been conducting my own experiment, and that is to consume the hearts of three youths, their collective age being no more than 25. I've been careful to select members of society who will not be missed, a boy and a girl, and then my young cousin Stephen came to me as a most unexpected gift. Now, it is important to take the heart from a living being, which does create the inconvenience of getting rid of the mortal remains, but I have found that a false wall in the cellar helps me take care of that. I find it best to take the heart, to burn it to ash, and then mix the ash in a strong red wine for consumption. My young cousin Stephen is coming to me soon, and I do believe that tonight I shall achieve immortality. The authorities had been perplexed at the death of Abner Dabney, and they finally concluded that in some bizarre accident, a wild creature had come through the window and attacked him. But young Stephen, after reading the journal, well, he reached a very different conclusion. <laughs> wow.